folks. Okay, uh, again, I'd just like to say thank you very much to the Organic Growers Alliance for inviting me here. It's, uh, yeah, that was mine. Yeah. And if we have any Monty Python fans in the audience, as they say, and now for something completely different. <laughs> what I would like to do today is talk about some research we've been doing, uh, which again has been funded by uh, Innovative Farmers Grant, really looking at the influence of a wood chip, wood chip made solely from, from willow on apple and pear scab. And, and what I'd like to emphasize at the onset is that even though I've kind of focused on just one disease, what I'm going to talk about is perhaps maybe something a little bit different, a bit unique when it comes to disease management that really has applicability. I, I mean, I, I grow my own vegetables. Uh, the previous, I love biochar, by the way. I use a lot of biochar. It's, it's great. And, and biochar is one of these products. It really, the, the, the crappier the soil, it's a scientific word, <laughs> crappier, the crappier the soil, the better the results with biochar. If you've got a good quality soil, but again, and, and this kind of also links in really nicely. So if you do have issues with pests and diseases, uh, again, I'm sure you'll find this talk pretty useful. So uh, apologies as well. Uh, I am an academic, which basically means I'm quite nerdy. I'm, I'm quite geeky. I will be putting some data up there, so you might just want to, as I always say, when you come to visit the lab, you kind of take a, a big, deep breath and welcome to the dork side for at least the next 30, 40 minutes. So can I have the first slide, please, Ben? Okay, this, this is the issue, and I do a lot of work with tree diseases, not just scab. I do a lot of work with ash dieback. I, I do a lot of work with uh, sudden oak death and acute oak decline. Really what we're trying to emphasize is certain diseases can be absolutely devastating to trees. I mean, if you're really into your trees, we have a horse chestnut tree. For example, about 10 years ago, we imported in this trees with a bacterial disease, Pseudomonas bleeding canker. The horse chestnut tree in the next 30, 40 years will not be here. If acute oak decline and sudden oak death goes the way it's going, Potentially, we're going to lose all our oaks. Ash dieback, 98, 99% of all our ash trees are going to go. So really, what can we do about it? And if I use the next slide, please. And if you just flip up a few slides. This is, is what we do. Uh, we spray. Oh, man, we love, we absolutely love to spray. And, and there's a number of issues. In fact, uh, if you actually look at the top left, this is a research grant I was involved with. That was funded by DEFRA. And DEFRA didn't believe we had the facilities to spray trees that were 35 meters high. So we kind of got them in. This is at Scion Park, just around the back from Kew Gardens. And we sprayed some 35 meter high oak trees. And I decided to put a bit of blue dye in there just to show we could. And uh, so we basically sprayed a load of 30, 35 meter oak trees blue. And I kind of went home and my kids were a lot younger and I said, oh, what did you do today then, Daddy? And I said, oh, I sprayed a load of oak trees blue. And he says, what, what do you do that for? He says, well, it pays surprisingly more than you'd think. <laughs> but what I'm trying to emphasize is that we do have a reliance, a very heavy reliance on spraying chemicals. And, and there's a number of issues once we start to rely too heavily on these chemical products. So again, the next slide please, or this next. Really, one of the problems are that once a tree is infected, it's really, really hard to manage that disease. It doesn't matter how many sprays we put on, it's very, very problematic. There's also the issues is that we are starting to see build up in tolerance of pests and diseases to, uh, uh, again, various pesticides that we again have a, an over-reliance on. And, and my colleague who I'm doing this work with, Tony, said, really from a grower's perspective, this summed it up. There was one called dodine. Uh, it's widely used in uh, conventional and causing concern. So, so really what we need is, is, is maybe a different way of looking at how we're going to manage these problems. And I am based at the university. And one of the great things is you get to kind of, I, I have a lot of PhD students, which is nice. And I kind of like to chat with them a lot. So, and, and, and again, <laughs> What I also like to do is get a bit of audience participation, which means I'm going to talk to you guys and you've got to talk back to me. And you're probably thinking, oh, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> no, we don't sign. So maybe look at it differently. How do we, as humans, how do we control 
diseases, and I'm talking the real nasties, the ones that kill us. I'm talking typhoid and diphtheria and cholera and tetanus and malaria. How do we manage them? What? Vaccinations. Vaccinations, absolutely. Spot. We, we literally, we, we inject ourselves with a weakened strain. Go to the next slide, please. Yeah, sorry, a little bit about the options. Maybe I've jumped a little bit. But uh, again, the reason this next slide, what I wanted to emphasize is, and, and really when it comes to a lot of these diseases, we do have an over-reliance on sanitation, as if we fell the tree and set it on fire. And in an example of that, there was an, an outbreak of sudden oak death, and it actually jumped onto Japanese larch trees. And in the county of Somerset alone, 30, is it, yeah, I think it's, no, sorry, 3 million Japanese larch trees have been felled and set on fire to try and slow down or eradicate this, this, this phytophthora disease, and it hasn't really, really worked. So we do have a over-reliance, and, and this is a slide, it's not mine, I just thought it was kind of amusing, <coughs> whereby we have uh, Dutch elm disease, so we fell all the elm trees, and, and we have ash dieback, so we fell in all the ash trees, and, and we have this phytophthora disease, which is killing off all the larch, so we fell them, and, Decline. But what I say, there is a different option. So again, the next slide. And, and it's really this vaccination principle. And one of the advantages of vaccination is how often do you need a vaccination? Every week, every month, every year, every 10 years? Don't talk to me. <laughs> Usually it lasts a long, long, that's the key thing. It lasts a long time long time. So the question is, why don't we apply those principles to our trees? Not just for scab, but for ash dieback, for sudden oak death, etc. And, and the thing is, you, you actually can. So again, next slide please. And, and this vaccination principle, it's nothing new. It's been around for a long, long time. And, and again, it was really in the early 20th century, I think it was around about 1908, this concept of pre-treating trees. And what you can do is a bit like us. If we uh, are going to go abroad to, say, Senegal, and one of the injections you need is yellow fever, now they're not going to inject you with yellow fever, because if you do, you'll die. So what they do is they take that disease and they weaken it. They weaken it in the lab. And what you're injected with is what we call an attenuated strain. It's a weakened strain. It's classic Edward Jenner. Edward Jenner realised when smallpox was wiping out millions of people, he realised that milkmaids never, ever really contracted smallpox. And the reason why is that they contracted milkpox, which didn't kill them, but boosted their immune system and protected them against smallpox. Now in those days, you could actually do experiments with small children. And that's exactly what Edward Jenner did. He proved his principles using small children. Now we've moved on a little bit. We, we can't kind of do that. But we can use the same, please, oh no. we can use the same principles of boosting a tree's immune system. And, and there's so many research studies been done. Now, one of the main advantages of boosting trees' immune system is when you do that, so it protects against uh, Erwinia. Now, the key thing here, Erwinia is a bacterial disease. The next slide. Phytoph Phytophthora, you may be familiar with. Uh, Phytophthora infestans, potato blight. Phytophthora is actually classified as, as, as an algae. It's a brown algae. It's not actually a fungal disease. Well, the point is, if you were treating for fire blight, you'd have to use a bacteria side. If you were treating for phytophthora, you have to use an algae side. If you're treating for powdery mildew, you have to use a fungus side. If you're treating for a wilt disease, then you have to start injecting your trees with various uh, triazole fungicides. Different diseases, each requiring a, a different type of chemical product, which is wonderful if you sell chemical products, if you work in the... Uh, pharmaceutical industry, this is what you want. But by boosting a tree's own immune system really confers protection against all these, whether it's bacteria, whether it's fungal, whether it's an algae, etc. So this has really attracted a lot of interest. So, 
And, 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 and again, believe it or not, the, the previous speaker said trees or plants are, are cleverer than humans. Seriously, they are way, way cleverer than us. They have some great systems. It, you know, even though we could argue evolutionary-wise, we always say we're superior. Trees actually do have superior traits that we don't, and one of them is defence. So, for example, you're going abroad, and as we say, if, if you get a, an injection for typhoid, it will only protect you against typhoid. If you contract cholera, because you thought, oh, I'm not paying that much to get an injection, I'll run the risk that typhoid isn't going to protect you. You need one injection for typhoid, one for cholera, one for diphtheria, etc., etc. But trees, once you actually switch on their defense systems, you don't just switch on one defense system, you switch on about 13. And, and this is where it gets a bit geeky. So what we get is trees like us contain antibodies, we call them phytoalexins. So really you get an increase in lots of things like phytoalexins and all these antifungal compounds. The leaves become thicker. If you're a conifer tree, uh, uh, basically you start to produce more resin and oil, which again, diseases don't like resin and oils and, and phenolics. If you want to know what a phenolic tastes like, just get an apple, drop it on the ground, and when it's all nice and brown and bruised, take a big bite out of it. It doesn't taste nice, it's the, it's the phenolics. And it doesn't taste nice to humans, it doesn't taste nice to insects. So uh, again, what it does, it's you're inducing multiple defense systems, which diseases find hard to overcome. So what else do we have? And, and, and again, this is the key one, that you get resistance, you get a whole spectrum, virus, bacteria, fungal, etc., etc. And believe it or not, there's actually a range of products which are commercially available that switch on tree defense systems. So if you live in the United States, you would buy one called Messenger. Uh, the active ingredient, the AI, is called Harpin Protein. If you're in Germany, you would use Bion. Uh, you can actually now buy AgriFoss in the United Kingdom. Okay? And it works by switching on tree defense systems. The active ingredient, and this is really important, it's potassium phosphate, I-T-E. It's not phosphate. That doesn't work. Okay? It's phosphite. And, uh, and then the one I use is it's called Rigel because that is commercially available. And the active ingredient is salicylic acid, which we know better as aspirin. Aspirin, and it sounds crazy, but if you treat plants with aspirin, you switch on tree defense, any plant defense systems, whether it's a squash or a tomato or a begonia or a blade of grass, doesn't matter. You switch on those defense systems. I'm not saying rush out, buy lots and lots of aspirin. These products that are out there are a little bit, uh, a little bit better. And, and then again, if you're in Japan, you have a different one. So uh, again. The only issue with using these products is that I do a lot of work with trees in urban landscapes. And one of the things we found as part of our research, which I thought was a small but significant step, was this is us planting trees and this is us treating very big mature trees by breaking up, decompacting, using an airspace. Is that you can apply these products I've just mentioned, you can apply them as a drench. So you don't need to run out and spray your entire tree. It's real bucket chemistry. You can actually just add it to a bucket of water and drench the root system. And it's what we call an induced response. So we switch on the defense systems in the root and that goes all the way up throughout the entire tree. So that's the key message that we can treat. So, so for me, it really opened up these different avenues. And it links into really the talk. And, and I've done a lot of research. So Again, if you think about it, there's lots and lots of different species of trees out there. Where do we derive many of our medicines and pharmaceuticals from? Plants, trees. For example, uh, Taxacol is a, a, a cancer-fighting drug, and the Latin name for you is Taxus Baccata. Taxacol is derived from yew trees. But the point is, you know, uh, the previous speaker mentioned all about the nutritional qualities of, of mulches or different. But we always forget plants contain a whole spectrum of what we term alleliochemicals. These, these are different types of what we call secondary metabolites. These are the oils, the resins, these, these taxicols. 
I mean, that's the bottom right is a mulch made purely from eucalyptus. And if you go into the body shop and you buy all the tea tree stuff and the, the face washes and all that, it's all derived from eucalyptus. But the point is we're trying to emphasize is the chemical makeup of different trees is very, very different. And, and I use wood chip a lot. Go to the next slide, please. So maybe now we can start to see the link between, because of course, if I wanted to apply salicylic acid, what type of tree do you think is very high in salicylic acid? Yeah, yeah willow, because silex. Willow is silex. And, and in the olden days, uh, what they used to do is, is they used to make tea from willow bark, which they used to use as, as, as for medicinal purposes. So again, this type of technology, and that's really where we started this research. We thought, well, we've got all these diseases all coming into the UK, and as the previous speaker said, growing willow is unbelievably easy. Even if you plant it upside down, it will grow. And it's really easy to get like they're going for biomass. So again, we decided to really focus on this willow wood chip. We have done a, a lot of research looking at mulches made from different tree species. It's all been published. If you want to read the papers, you know, we found certain mulches are very good at enhancing mycorrhizal association and stimulating root growth. Uh, a mulch made purely from uh, eucalyptus is excellent at really managing honey fungus and soil borne diseases. But I'm really going to focus on willow mulch. And this is the reason why. When we first started doing this research, again, I had an orchard. We're growing lots of apples, lots of scab. The only difference between those uh, trees is really one has a willow mulch. And we've applied it because of the salicylic acid in the mulch goes into the soil, comes into contact with the tree roots, switches on the defense systems. So really what we've got is quite a nice system. Uh, that we could potentially use on, on a larger scale. So that's really the background. And as we can see, this is what the tree, the whole tree looked like. Again, we had the control in the top left, the willow mulch, and we did compare it against a conventional fungicide. And, and what we're starting to find is that this type of concept of switching on tree defense systems, it's very, very good, but it's not great. I, I mean, if you do rely heavily on repeat sprays of fungicide, as in penconazole, you will get better control. But, so we're still fine-tuning the system, but this induced resistance is, is it's very good. We'll get anything from 60 to 70%. So if we can just continue, next slide, please. And, and to me, there are so many different types of willows, aren't there? I mean, there's, there's, I think there's about 80, over 100. There's red willows, there's yellow willows, there's orange willows, there's corkscrew willows, there's, there's curly, twisty willows, and I've only ever used one. So one of the things we decided when we were starting to do this research is, is really uh, aims were to really assess the efficacy of, of maybe a few different types of willow wood chip at different orchards, throughout the, the UK. And we were looking at apple and pear scab. Again, we, we could have, have used any types of disease. Uh, we just wanted to focus on, as we say, the scab. And we wanted to know whether or not the salicylic acid content of, of different willow species were some better than others, were some high in salicylic acid and some low. Uh, and then we wanted to assess how uh, effective it was at managing the scab diseases. And then importantly, we wanted to look at the influence on fruit quality, and we did that by looking at the sugar content using a BRICS analysis. And if you're interested in a, a BRICS analysis, there's another one of the stands is, is doing some free demonstrations and foliar nutrient content. The next slide, please. So really what we're seeing is quite a diverse range. And really the... S. alba is the white willow, Silex alba, very low, where the top one, Silex daphnoides, was a lot, lot higher. Next slide. And, and these are the sites we looked at. We looked at sites in Buckinghamshire, we looked at sites in Somerset, in Hereford, in Harwich, uh, again in Hereford, in Pencoid. In, so it was quite diverse. And we also looked at a range of, of different species of apple and pear. 
So really what we did is we set these trials up, and there's myself and my colleague where we literally, you can see the willow wood chip at the base of the tree, and we're assessing scab levels. Next slide, please. And, and we used a pictorial guide. And, and really what we're saying is the top left is a zero, no scab. We wanted to try and keep it relatively simplistic, so the top left is a zero, uh, where, where the bottom right is a four, very, very heavily infested. So we simply took literally 10 to 15 leaves per tree, five leaves per treatment. Next slide, please. And, and then again, we also looked at fruit scab severity as well. And then the next slide. And then we could take samples back and, and do kind of the, the sugar analysis using, using the bricks. And, and then also we could send leaf samples away and we did a whole breakdown of nitrogen, sulfur. So we're kind of looking at disease, reductions in disease severity, foliar nutrient content. Big deep breath, a lot of data. But it's the only one, the only one. Because, as you can imagine, we've got so much data. We've got all these sites and we've got all these different species. What we really wanted to show that, really, the ones in red was where we had a significantly lower scab severity. So, sadly, what we were finding was it really didn't work in all orchards. And I'm only just going to put this one slide. I could put up another one with fruit scab severity and bricks analysis and nitrogen, but it would be like having your feet sawn off. It would be a very slow and painful process of me going through all this horrendous data. So we're just going to stay with that. So really, as we say, we started to see some effects, some positive, and this was throughout. Some sites it worked and some sites it didn't work, which as a scientist is a little bit, oh well, we tried. Uh, so then what I did is I took all the data from all the sites and all the species, which is really, once you do that, sadly they're really, oh, and it is a bit sad, they're, too much came out of it. What we're showing is that really taking all that data, that across the board, the average scab severity was 1.4 in the controls and 1.2 in the mulch, but it's not significant. Only the orchards that sprayed with chemicals really brought it down. Again, the fruit scab, there was a drop, but perhaps not as good as we would like. And in terms of the sugar, it was slightly higher. And, and again, the nitrogen also. So it kind of appears there was maybe some trend towards, you know, some effect. So uh, again, really what we were saying was that Apple scab, it, it was lower than non mulch but it wasn't statistically lower. And that's for all the sites. And likewise, same with the fruit, sugar was slightly higher, but not significantly so. And, and, and same with the leaf nutrient content, and only the fungicide sprays kind of really didn't have any effect on the leaf uh, foliar nutrient content and the sugar, but it did lower the scab. So again, and, 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 and again, I, I don't want to be too critical, but one of the things we did find, and it was a little bit of a shame, because in the guidelines, we really wanted, you know, it comes down to how much wood chip you're going to put on. And, and what we found was that really we wanted each tree to have five kilo. Uh, and, and in some cases, we found that the amount applied was, was really far lower than that what we recommended. And what you had in some cases was a really big tree and, and only a, again, Monty Python, a waffer thin layer of, of wood chip. And, and I kind of felt that was a shame. And, and I didn't realize, because again, when I was talking to some of the growers, they said, well, we sweep the apples off the ground and the wood chip would get in with all the brushes. So we only put a, a waffer thin layer, which, uh, you see, that was kind of my trials. And you can see, this is what we were really recommending, you know, this mulch would last, you know, a good two or three years, and, and we get some really good results from it. But if, and again, I'm honestly, it's just kind of the things you live and you learn. And, and this is some of the trial sites, and as we say, I mean, if you look at the left, you can just about see a, a little bit of mulch. And, and again, the one on the right, huge tree, just a little bit of mulch. And, and, and again, saying that, as I say, it's a learning process, but the trends were kind of going in the right direction and like any research project we did learn a, a lot from it what was interesting is that 
maybe if we did take this forward, we found like we did use a, a lot of wood chip from like the white willows, which were inherently low. We now know the the the, the Daphnoides, the scarlet willow, is is literally you know like a, you know at least eight to ten fold higher. And interesting, one of the sites or a couple of the sites where we did get positive results used the Daphnoides. So if we did take it forward, we would focus on different uh, willow species, the corkscrew willows. Uh, again, and maybe again, the previous speaker mentioned how, where the willow, uh, the wood chips derived from. And we found it maybe willow bark might be a, a, a little bit better. And, and likewise, maybe if we used a little bit more scab intermediate or resilient species, brought it in as part of an intrigated control. But, but I think really the fact that we now have these uh, salicylic acid sprays, this Rigel G, maybe in combination, maybe just looking at that. So again, I thought it was a really good idea in concept. Uh, we learned a lot from it. Uh, it was a little bit, as I say, I felt a little bit of a shame that perhaps they really weren't at many of the orchards as much willow bark wood chip laid down. But Saying that, you know, uh, the previous speaker mentioned about the, the use of the wood chip and growing squash. Again, I, I'd say I, I grow a lot of vegetables and, and I do use this type of, of wood chip. And again, I also layer, you know, the walkways with wood chip, but I use a willow one. So again, it moves in and, and we get good results, but we just use a lot more of it, that's all. But all in all, yeah, I'd just like to say, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>